Hello everybody, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me, your host Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 193, Uno Nueve Tres, right? Uno Dos Tres, yeah, Uno Nueve Tres. How are you doing? How are you feeling, bros, ladies, sisters, gentlemen, people of the earth? Hopefully you are well this morning, you are well lubricated, hydrated, rested, limbered and you've just had the great start of the week. Today is Tuesday morning, as I'm sure you guys are aware, the sun is shining through the window on my right or on your left or on my left or on your right, whichever side it is, it's sun is shining, so let's be happy about that. I've opened the window slightly this morning because it's a little bit steaming here because I decided to have some fried eggs this morning and I guess I left the stove on a little bit too long because then when I put the oil when it just started popping, 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 I nearly got some third degree burns on my forearm but I managed to keep it under control but obviously the consequence of that is that you get all this smoke in the air. So I have to open it a little bit, get some fresh air in, hopefully the microphone isn't picking up that much noise, but I guess it probably is, right, isn't it? So I'll probably have to close it. I think it's picking up too much noise. One second. Mad agility. You see that agility? Look at that agility. Um, I had to. I, you probably can't see it from here, but I've got like a little tiny pocket of space I can't really move out of, so I had to just jump out, make loads of noises, and here I am. Anyway, um, am I out of breath? That's weird if I was out of breath. But anyway, I'm feeling well. Thank you for asking. In case you were wondering where I've been and how I've been feeling, I'm feeling pretty good. In general, all things considered, I've had a bit of a weird week weekend in general, you know. I think I tend to have a lot of these, uh, pardon me, weird weekends and in general where I start to question my life choices, decisions I've made, places I've been, uh, the place I'm in at currently at the moment, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in um, where you are exactly where you should be, right, I don't really buy the whole like, um, oh, someone's got to put me on, I should be here, I deserve to be this, da 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 da. What do you call that entitlement? Probably is, right? I'm not a big believer in entitlement. I'm not a really big believer in, like, you know, um, I deserve this sort of mantra or sayings. I think, you know, exactly what I said in the beginning, like, where you are is where you probably should be, where you deserve to be at that current state of time. It represents all the work you've done so far or the, or the lack of work you're doing. And I think in my life or in my journey, in my career and the things I've been doing, I think I am where I am. And the fact that I'm frustrated about it is a good thing because it shows that, you know, I still have some ambition left in me, even though my actions probably aren't marrying up. My act aren't marrying up to my ambitions even though that's the case I still feel the fact that I'm frustrated and a bit annoyed with where I am and what I'm doing shows that there is something in me that's still kind of pushing me forward which is the best thing possible right but I think after this weekend and after the weekends prior to this I think I need to start making some changes um in my life in general I need to think I need I need to figure out exactly what I want to do and how I want to do it and just commit to that path wholly and then see where I get from, and see where I am at the end of the journey. Because I think so far it's been all right. I've done pretty well, right? I've done okay. I'm probably I'm I'm achieving ten percent, if not five percent, of my overall goals. But I think um I'm doing it in spite of my actions. I'm not doing it because of my actions, right? Um I'm kind of getting there because you know just through luck or just because I'm the only person doing that kind of thing and the only person hustling. But I think my actions aren't really the result of my. My my actions aren't really the result of the rewards I'm getting. It's just like a luck sort of thing. I think that's happening overall. And I don't and I'm in a weird position where I'm conscious of that and I don't want to run out of my luck. I don't want to take advantage of the position that I have, fuck it up, and then really have to start from zero, right? I'm starting from let's say um a one or a two. But if I really if I really start taking the piss out of my blessings and my rewards, I know for sure it's gonna go back to a one and then I'm gonna be starting from ground zero. So um if you're wondering where all this kind of vague conversation is coming from essentially with the whole DJing stuff and with the podcast and with some other bits and bobs that I'm doing as well on the outside that have not been announced just yet um there seems to be some kind of momentum building right it seems to be going a little bit better for me things are becoming a little bit easier the responses are being are, are being quite good people are, are endorsing the things that I'm doing they're saying what I'm doing is fun they like what I'm doing blah blah blah, blah right a lot, a lot of good responses a lot of good feedback but I think I'm also doing some things that are hindering my success, right? Which is, you know, going out, maybe partaking in a little bit too much of the whole recreational lifestyle in terms of nightlife. And for, for you guys that are watching it, who go out a lot, you know exactly what I mean. And I think it's kind of, it's kind of taken a little bit, it's kind of taken over me somewhat, sense of, without me even realizing, it's probably taken 
a lot more of a priority over the things I'm doing and I like to realize. I think um, over the last year or year and a half, I've got to a point where, especially with the DJing side of things, where I've kind of met, I suddenly made the shift towards loving going to DJ just because of the sense of DJing, right? Going to DJ in the nightclub and sharing the music that I've kind of researched and put together and organizing the playlist and stuff that I've downloaded and trying to get strangers to dance to it. That's been a really gratifying thing for me, right? Something that I've kind of seeked a lot of pleasure in. But I made that shift only like a couple of years ago, right? Where I've kind of, that's been the, the goal. Beforehand, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to say like, you know, to be completely honest, the DJ thing was just an excuse for me to go out, right? I don't necessarily go out as much as I used to go out. Um, obviously, you know, when you're, when you're in a relationship, when you're in a relationship, that makes things a little bit more difficult because, you know, you can't necessarily just keep going out every Friday and Saturday. You know, you look like a bit of a psycho. But I think having the DJ gig gave me a convenient excuse to keep going out, right? To do those kind of things because it's like, oh, look, I've got to do this. It's part of my career, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure people do that with loads of other things, right? Even if they're an influencer, if they're an artist, if they're a designer, whatever. They probably tend to, you know, I'm assuming people that are on the road a lot, like, the, you know, the comedians, all that sort of stuff. It's probably the same sort of ilk, right? You don't really want to go home and there's a reason for it. Or the people that fight all the time, right? And they pass their sell by date. They're always in training camp. They're always fighting. There is a part of this, like, you know, you can't let go of the um, attention. You always want to be in front of the camera. You want to be in training camp because you're away from home. You don't want to set face up your responsibilities. You want to, I don't know, just keep reliving this high that you had when you were younger. And especially for me, I, I would imagine most people are the same. You know, you keep chasing that high of when you were younger, when everything was new and fresh, and it's never going to be the same, right? Um, that first couple of years when I was in Shoreditch, in Dawson, hanging out, getting introduced to the kind of hipster scene there, then progressing into kind of maybe the kind of dive bar, RE scene, then kind of progressing out of that and going into the underground electronic scene and seeing all those kind of warehouse parties at the, I forgot what that car park is called in Shoreditch, and then kind of going where I am now. Those those first few moments were valuable, invaluable to me, right? They're the things that kind of define me. Um, they really helped kind of mold who I am, get, um, kind of allow me to kind of tap into different sort of interests I didn't know I even had. So they were really crucial into my life, but I can't, try and replicate that feeling it's impossible it's not going to ever happen again that's what that was a moment in time and i think in general in my life anyway i think i've had a tendency to always try and replicate things that happened right i don't know why it is i'm not sure if this is a kind of um, a thing of my a, a character defect or whatever it may be but i always do try and repeat things whether it's like you know you meet someone on a trip somewhere and you try and reach out to them the next time you go there and it's not the same you try and do it yeah you know i mean try and repeat things but it's like sometimes you just, you just leave stuff in the moment of time that existed that moment in time was special it's great you had a, sh a great time now move on it's like with friends right sometimes you have friends that were specific to the part of your life that what you were going through at that, per at, that per at that point in time right so university friends a friend you met when you're working in a, a shop a friend you met when you were on a training course a friend you met when you were did, did, did. these are friends right i'm a, i'm a big i'm a big um friend naysayer i like to always say oh you know people aren't your friends unless they know that your net your mom's met your mom's name but i do think there is that person that you can meet on a training course you know and that could be your friend, right? For six weeks, you went, you went on a security guard training course and you met some guy there that was, you know, you always had lunch with and you went um, home together and maybe you met each other at the station. That's your friend. But once you get your jobs and you, you know, you're working in North, he's working in South, it's going to be hard for you to link up anymore, right? Because you're working all the time. It's going to be hard to replicate that feeling again because you're not, you're not um, newbies anymore. You've now got a job. So it's different. And I think I have to kind of get to that point of, in life where I'm not trying to replicate. I'm not trying to repeat. I'm not trying to restart these things again because it's not going to happen the same way and that's okay because you know i've evolved i'm a different person and i've got new experiences but i also um the most important thing is that i'm trying to make this a career i'm trying to make turn my hobby that I find really fun i'm trying to make this a career because that's something that i've always kind of wanted to do right looking up to people in the industry in the creative spaces that are doing cool interesting things i've never had an inferiority complex right i've never thought oh i can't do this i can't do that whatever i've always known that if i do the work and i plan myself i can do it and the thing that kind of drew me to it was always the fact that these people especially you know in the, in the words of um uh aaron bondaroff is it's about turning your lifestyle into a business right being able to kind of get paid for just being yourself right um and that's kind of the ultimate goal for any creative and i think when you see that goal and you see someone doing it like wow that's amazing right get paid to be yourself but it's not get paid to be yourself the way you were partying it's get paid to be yourself in terms of the thing that you enjoy in that scene whether it's putting on exhibitions whether it's taking pictures whether it's writing whether it's just being the producer or the director behind the scenes whether it's the front of the camera it's about that side of things but you're gonna have to sacrifice other things in order to kind of do the work because it requires content like so it's case in point this podcast right 
it's a it's a constant content stream, right? Case in point, a blog. It's a constant which I haven't even updated. It's a constant um, content stream, DJ. Constant, constant, constant content stream. You have to be always on it in order to kind of get to the next stage. And I think that's something I've kind of failed to do in that regard. Like I've been okay applying myself in some regards, but some regards I've kind of let myself go. And I think over the weekend, this weekend, the past weekend, before that, some certain events have happened, which I probably won't go into detail on here, but, you know, events have kind of like, you know, really kind of awoken me and made me think, you know what? I don't think like, you know, it's like, I don't think the top performers, the people that are killing it would be here at this party this late. I don't think the top performers that are killing it will be indulging in all this stuff. I don't think top performers that are killing it will be doing this X, Y, and Z. They wouldn't be, right? They'd be they'd be spending every waking moment from seven until one after they finish work, preparing a playlist, researching stuff to play, thinking about themes, putting those things together, ideas, honing it down to a way it's like it's in your memory, it's like fucking lasered in, um, sorting out their USBs and their playlists before they even get to a gig, not on the day before on the day of the day of a few hours before not winging things really going for it really really fine-tuning their thing because this is now it's bigger than just a passion it's something that they want to propel and support their lifestyle and if that's the case and you have to treat it with respect right i think i've said here before about you know normal jobs nine to five is treating it with respect which you know which is in my case has been quite difficult because there's been some lack of respect shown on that side but usually you know i always say like you should treat your job with respect which is true and you should also treat your passion project something that you're hoping to do for life of something that you would happily take half the money for to do right day in day out you should be, treat that with even more reverence right because you're one of the few lucky few that gets to go out there and uh, kind of like do your dream and have that pay for your life like it's something that not a lot of people can can kind of say they kind of have been able to do it's, it's a rare thing to do right? it's not the easiest thing to do in the world because you know if everyone could do it we well, all would but it requires a lot of effort and i think again these last few weeks i've kind of realized that there's some things that have been happening in my work life that i'm not happy with but those are things that i really can't control there's nothing i can do about that situation really i can make the best of it i can try my best to kind of you know make sure i can i can make it work for me but it's not something that i can really influence i can't do nothing about it so I'm going to have to make sure that I just do the best I can. So I have to make sure I can do more than the best I can with what I have, my kind of like quote-unquote passion, my quote-unquote talent, and try and really go for that and achieve that um, in the way it needs to be. So I think this is kind of one of those public declarations where I just say, you know, I think enough with the drugs, man. That's it really for me. Um, I'm kind of done. I'm out of it. Um, it's the end. I need to just concentrate on my passion and get that done because i don't want to fuck things up i don't want to exhaust my good fortune which i've been fortunate of i've been kind of succeeding in spite of doing all that stuff in spite of staying out until ungodly hours in spite of socializing with people that probably i shouldn't be socializing with right it should just be like you know you get booked for an event you do the event you leave right because you, you're, you're a professional you've done the work you can socialize a little bit and then you can just go home because you know you've done the work you're a good person um, and in general, you know, I've, I've always kind of been aware that my personality as it is, is already a little bit intense, a little bit wild, a little bit extra. When you add some other substances to the concoction, when you're trying to be the center of attention, when you're, you know, first thing for attention in that sake, it kind of can only go one way. And again, that isn't where I want to be. And in general, like I said, I've, I've made that switch already in my head where I'm in it for the love of the music. I'm in it for the love of sharing. I'm in it for the love of connection. I'm in it for the love of just the, the love of just going into a room, sort of like a comedian, right? Going into a room that people don't, of people that don't know you, have no context of who you are and making them laugh. Same way with a DJ, going into a room and have no context of who you are. They already make their assumptions about who you are based on what you look like and making them dance. That's the really big thing to do and it's really hard. And I'm hoping now over time that I can achieve that and kind of get to a place where, I'm kind of doing the good work, the right work, and it kind of propels me forward in the things I want to do. So this is kind of, again, public decorations are something I've kind of a bit cringed over, but I think in my case, this is something I kind of need to do in order to kind of get myself to the next step. So yeah, I guess for anyone watching this and everything, I guess if you want to, I'll really implore my other fellow um, London creatives, worldwide creatives out there who have kind of been in the same sort of journey that I have been We've kind of been around from the beginning of the inception of this stuff and seen others kind of, you know, really um, propel their careers forward and have been sitting there wondering, oh, why has this happened to others? You know, we know why, right? Let's be honest. We know why we haven't achieved the things that we want to achieve. We know why it is. Sometimes it could be just down to you not having the talent. 
call that happens there is a percentage of us that's going to happen to you but i think the large percentage of us is down to our application it's down to how seriously we're taking it it's down to how much effort we're really putting forth and if we're really honest about it we're not doing the things that we need to do and i think we can be honest about it and say that's the truth so this is what i'm trying to do now i'm recognizing i haven't done as much as i can do i'm succeeding in spite of my actions not because of my actions and now this is the kind of step i need to take forward and kind of to make sure that i achieve the next step because again there's so much riding on what i'm doing now it's not just me it's for my immediate family it's for my friends and family it's for the people that are around me that is who i'm kind of responsible for um in terms of kind of leading set an example for and it's not just for me do you know what i mean i've got a lot of people riding or kind of depending on me to kind of make sure that i do this and do the right thing and again if it's about legacy what do i want do you know do i want do i want to be the life of the party in east london do i want to be known as that person or do i want to be known as a person who at least tried to go for something it did might not have worked out but wow what a journey it was and if it does work out double bonus right but I don't want to be have my legacy go down as like, oh, the guy that was the most fun, the guy that cracked the most jokes, oh, the guy that was um the most happy to hand out X, Y, Z, the guy that was able to stay up until 11 a.m. in the morning. I don't want that to be my legacy. So again, like I said before, public decorations are a bit corny, a bit cringe, but this one needs to be done. And this is me kind of doing it and setting forth that from now on, the change is going to come, you know, and it's already May. So there's plenty of time for me to kind of um, set those habits in place and then, you know, not look back until then, really. So, yeah, here we go, man. Here it is, man. We're declaring, we're declaring and we're moving on. Um, anyway, <sighs> now I'm happy I got it off my chest, actually. Um, and then uh, on top of that, well, as an aside, I did actually DJ this weekend on Friday and Saturday, which was, again, double header, which is always an interesting um, start to the weekend. Very tiring, but, you know, interesting to say the least. On Friday, I played at Tapis, which is great, as usual, in Westford Stratford. And on Saturday, I played a house party in Dawson, or in Hackney, near London Fields. A very interesting experience. We took some speakers with us, took a mixer. We, I set up shop there, plugged everything in, blah, blah, blah. And again, a quite, really, really good house party, I have to be honest. So, um, one of the, probably the better ones I've been to, I think partly because of the house itself. It was a really decent size. You know, sometimes, because I think I've been so used to playing in warehouse parties in Hackney Wick, which are usually in warehouses or like abandoned, you know, commercial buildings which are really big and sometimes it's, it's like a nightclub in there right and usually uh, apart from halloween house parties or new year's eve house parties they're never that full because you know everyone's got their other things they're going to um you can never quite fill the room as much as you really hope to even if you're the person organizing the party it's never that full so it kind of loses a bit of the house party vibe to it right but this house party felt really good because um the the rooms were really small the kitchen was tiny i, I guess it probably could fit at the most 50 people I'd say in the kitchen and it had a really big garden as well had a, a kind of a, a middle floor and upstairs too that you could go into and sit in people's rooms but for the most part the kitchen was tiny um which kind of again led to a lot of intimacy the people in front of me were just standing literally there was like two three rows three, two or three rows in front of me like hanging out which made things really fun and just a really good fun experience i really really enjoyed myself in that house party a really good time um i got a lot of good compliments on people again it's always nice to, i think in the beginning I, was, I used to get a little bit annoyed when people would be like oh my god loud you really knew how to like f uh play for the room um whatever kind because of, sometimes it can kind of come across as, like they were surprised i could do that again maybe because of um my appearance and what i look like and stuff maybe they think you know i don't know the scene i'm not a part of the culture or whatever maybe i don't know wh whatever it may be I used to get annoyed by it at first, but now I think it's part of my special power. I can go into a room, um, especially electronic music spaces, because I, I guess I, cause I don't look like an electronic music fan, maybe for the, for the, for the, for the uh, face of it. I'm not maybe wearing, a, I don't know, I'm not wearing, um, uh, I don't know, a Fortet t-shirt, Apex Twin merch or something. I maybe don't have a choker on or something. So people kind of, you know, automatically think you're not part of the scene. But I think my ability to go into a room not look like people that probably dance in there and be able to deliver the stuff that one day want to hear is probably my special power and something that i'm really conscious of that i do well going forward um and that's kind of something i've been very very aware of for the most part and um yeah it kind of worked out in my favor again because i think because i was the first person to play i played from like 11 until half one um they loved it i set the tempo of the party i organized the speakers i got everything going and yeah it worked out really well for me man i really really enjoyed it it was such a such a good time and I'm really pleased and happy that I got invited to do it in the first place again. And I think those things are really important to do because I think sometimes in those kind of spaces, there's always a person in there that you don't know who's kind of has is the decision maker or somebody that can influence a decision in certain parties or some other place that you go to. So if they see you play and they see that you're a good person, they could easily recommend you to somebody else. And I think I've noticed in my life anyway, 
most of the best gigs I've gotten haven't been because I've been asking people to play somewhere. It's usually always been because I showed and proved, right? Which is the annoying part of it. I think that goes back to the whole, like, you know, when you were in school and you could never get a job. I knew, for me anyway, my first job came, you know, it, it, it didn't come until a long, long time into my career or a long, long time into me applying. Maybe my first job was like 21, not including my stuff that I did when I was at Hollywood Bowl. I worked for a little while at Hollywood Bowl, but you know, my first, first kind of real job that I got from my CV was maybe when I was 21. And even then, it kind of came again through a recommendation. Um, that's how most of its stuff comes around, right? It comes partly from your effort and partly from recommendation, especially in the beginning. Um, once you get, you know, a bit of recommend, a bit of experience under your belt, you can then start selling yourself just as like a candidate off the, off the back of that. Um, now I've got like, you know, I've got a five to ten years worth of experience on my CV. I don't necessarily need someone to bring me in, but in the beginning of the DJing stuff, I used to kind of reach out to bars and clubs and email people, cold email them, send them send them um, mixes. Sometimes I'll try and call places and stuff and it never really stuck. It never worked out. I never really understood why because I'd be like, you know, the people that you have playing here are shit. I can do a much better job, blah, 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 you know. But then you realize, you think, no, actually the point is it's not that I'm not good or that they don't, you know, they don't think I'm good. It's that they don't want to take the chance, right? Um, if you know someone can do the job, and there's someone that you know, someone that you can depend on. Why would you then, why would you then go and risk and gamble on someone like me emailing you randomly? Because the chances of me being good are really thin, right? Small, for instance, right? Because for the most part, people that cold call you or cold email you are usually the shit ones, right? For the most part, it's never usually the people that you want to play at your place or you want to take part or want to be involved in anything that you're doing. It's usually somebody that's like, you know, trying to chance it. So I get the the hesitation to be like, you know, let's give this guy a chance because if I'm shit, if I go into a space and I, I don't know, I just start playing hardcore in like a pub in, in Wolves or somewhere, it's going to be hard for them to take me off the, off the decks, right? They're going to feel bad about it. They're going to let me play. I'm going to drive out punter, pun, punters. They're going to lose money at the bar and everyone loses then, right? I don't get booked again. They get, you know, made to look embarrassed. They have to pay me for it so they get out of pocket. It's just, and the next person that comes and emails them again will never get a chance again because I fucked it up. So they can't take that chance. So they'd rather just book somebody who already plays there or Simon knows the crowd, blah, blah, blah. So now I've realized that because of that, I have to, depend, especially now in the beginning stage, I have to depend more on my recommendations and playing in spaces with other people who are also good or in places or playing in spaces with people who know what good looks like or know what good sounds like. And it could be like, oh shit, this guy's pretty cool. He looks pretty decent. He seems like a, a decent guy. Let's get him again for something else. I'm hoping that is the case. And again, that's why I mentioned previously, I'm going to steer away from the whole party scene of it because I want to be, again, more rated in a sense of like, you know, this guy's a good DJ and we want him around as opposed to like, he's a lot of fun and he hangs out and he stays out until late. That isn't really what I want to go for, I think, in general. But yeah, that's about it really for me. Um, on the DJ side of things, ah, oh, thirsty today, yeah. I've been talking a bit too much. Um, Not a bit too much, it's only been half an hour. But anyway, that was it for the most part. I did that. And that was went pretty well. And again, yeah, I've got another Chocker Block weekend coming up. Probably going to DJ again on what, Saturday, this Friday coming up. Next, well, until the end of the month, I've got a Saturday gig at Heathcote and Star. And another one maybe on the bank holiday Monday coming up again. Um, for information regarding that, check out my website, agassino.com forward slash DJ gigs, all one word. Or just go to agassino.com, click on my DJ gigs tab and you can see all my dates on there listed. And yeah, let's move on to some topics because all that introspective chat. Has got me desperate to move the topic and move the fucking looking glass away from me. Oh, talking about away from me or what? No, talking about, you know, less introspective and more so on the outside world. Look, I've got a new haircut. So I got a haircut the other day before the gig because, you know, that's part of the ritual when you go into play somewhere new, you know, get the, sh the shave side and the beard trimmed. I'm happy with it. Good, good haircut and all that malarkey. But um, unfortunately, because the guy decided to use um, a close close to skin i don't know what they call it. you know those razors they they sell with the with the three little circle heads on top of it you decide to use that on the sides to kind of get my get it really looking at skin but unfortunately now it's kind of really irritated my skin and i've got loads of bumps everywhere so i guess next time i can't do that i've got bumps all around i think on the inside of my chin as well and now i've got a little coleslaw popping up on the bottom of my lip which is mostly due to stress really i think in life like i said work has been a little bit crazy um DJ life outside has been a bit crazy too so I think that's kind of again it's always a thing that happens to me like I think I try and pretend like I'm not stressed out I try and pretend like I'm not worried about things and then suddenly these things pop out on my lip like that and it kind of gets me really worried and now I'm in a really frantic space so I can't need to get that fucking thing settled out but yeah 
the heck I'm happy with is a new barber around, well, new, a, a barber that I haven't been to previously, but it's run by a couple of Pakistani dudes and an Iranian guy. An Iranian guy cut my hair and he cut it like this. So, so fucking cool, so clean, which I'm really happy with. They're really, they're really quick, professional. I go in, go out, and there's no fucking hassle there. There's no people like on their phones or eating chicken wings in the middle of your fucking haircut, which is helpful. Um, again, just a really mix up and change of things. I'm just, again, I'm, I'm always, uh, you know, I'm less about. I just want to, I watch on a good haircut, you know, I don't really care who gives it to me and the benefit that it's just literally five minutes up the road from where I live and um, it's fairly quick, it's, it's not as busy as some of the other barbershops I go to, makes things even more um, advantageous for me and something I'm probably going to stick with going forward. I'm trying to get them every two weeks now so I can at least have some kind of, you know, because the top of my head's fucking a mess as you can tell, but at least I'm going to have the sides cleaned up and that makes things better. And I think as well, my face is kind of slimming down a little bit as well, isn't it? Based on the running and stuff, I've been doing that a lot. I've been running quite a few miles these, these last couple of weeks. I'm going to run a few miles again this week or today, actually, after I finish um, doing all my workouts and uh, I finished doing all my work and stuff. So yeah, I'm happy with that in general. That makes the beard look better when your face is slimmed down because your, your cheeks get sucked in a little bit and I'm happy with that. And obviously the 100 push ups a day has been helping out too with the form as you can tell with the chest and the shoulders so things are going well anyway um apart from that apart from lick um what you got socking myself off let's get into some topics um number one on the radar here is some really disturbing news that's happened um during rolling loud um this year which i've been a bit but uh disturbed about but i think you know in general people probably just not they probably don't care as much as they probably should do because I guess this stuff happens all the time. But Rolling Loud has kind of uh, descended into um, an occasion or an opportunity for at least the world, uh, for the country, all across the, the United States to kind of nab everyone that they were kind of looking for or kind of had warrants on. Um, I think so far I've heard Kodak Black and young NBA young boy have been arrested or have been arrested or will be detained very soon and, and a few other people. Um, the NBA young boy story is the one that's probably the most disturbing, right? So supposedly this story gets really, really crazy because um, an innocent bystander was killed in the kind of crosshairs or in the crossfire of this uh, whole altercation. So supposedly, Rolling Loud, as you know, is the kind of, you know, really popular Miami, Florida, um, hip-hop um, concert, convention, festival that goes on for a weekend. They, they, you know, it's like a, an absolute bevy of the who's who of the kind of hip-hop scene, mostly um, centered or geared around um, kids that are coming up in the scene, like, you know, quote-unquote, the SoundCloud rappers. Now it's kind of, you know, trans. Um, a bit they've kind of introduced a lot more of the established names as a kid cuddy and stuff but mostly it's mostly some of the you know younger kids that are the ones taking part in this and one of these younger kids is an nba young boy a guy that's extremely popular within um the young kid space and the story goes supposedly got into some shootout with somebody called t grizzly and i think that's the detroit rapper right that's um that's signed to rock nation and yeah, it's just descended into a whole amount of craziness. So let me see if I can get the image up here. I think he took, did he take it down? There's an, he made this weird drawing. Okay, cool. So this is the thing that happened. So this is from DJ Academics page. Um, it says the following, right? So I think I've got to get up on here on screen from DJ Academics page. Uh, more details about the innocent man killed in the NBA young boy shooting, right? So it says, yeah, the picture does, doesn't even begin to describe the distance. A stray bullet traveled, killing an innocent man at work on Mother's Day. It went across three lanes of busy traffic, two big parking lots full of cars, multiple businesses before striking, killing him whilst he was sitting in a van, which is fucking crazy. So they got they got involved in some kind of shootout outside a nightclub. I'm assuming this was happening, right? Um, NBA Youngboy and T Grizzly. The initial story came out that supposedly NBA Youngboy's bodyguard uh, chased down the assailant, shot him and killed him. And then NBA Youngboy got back in the car. Um, I mean, whatever, was detained by police for a bit, questioned and let go. And then he went on to perform on stage, which seemed, you know, a little, you know, it seemed like something out of a movie, cool, whatever. It seemed like the kind of, you know, fit into the motif of being a gangster rapper in that in that sense. But then most, as the, more of the story kind of leaked and more information came out and then it kind of um, was revealed that supposedly during the crossfire or allegedly during the, cross, during the exchange of bullets that, a young lady that was with NBA Youngboy could be his girlfriend, could be his friend, could be his baby mother. We don't know who, what relationship, but she's part of the NBA Youngboy crew. Was struck by a bullet and was wounded and was taken to hospital. And that the assailant wasn't killed, but it was said it was an innocent man in a car that was killed. And I think it got said that he was, you know, in the crossfires, as in like he was there when it was happening, um, when they were shooting each other. But then the most disturbing or sad part about the story is that he was actually parked in his van somewhere, three, three lanes of traffic away from the actual event. 
the so stray bullet traveled across 300 traffic and hit him while he's just sitting in the car minding his own business, which is fucking disturbing. It makes the fact that NBA Young went on to perform on Rolling Loud stage a little bit disgusting, you know? It makes it a little bit scummy move to do. To after this whole situation happens, someone actually dies um through, you know, again, it's I guess it's no fault of his own precisely, but through their kind of, you know, personal beef, some innocent bystander ends up passing away. And yeah, man, I just don't know what's happening with these kids. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if this is a, a process of just, you know, this is what happens when you have actual gangster rappers involved in rap. And you know, it happens to be these guys are super popular and really young too, which, you know, isn't really a good combination. Um, there were stories recently that NBA Youngboy was maybe the most streamed or was the most streamed male artist on YouTube with the amount of people watching his videos. He's incredibly popular, a lot more popular than people probably understand outside of his core group. He makes really good music. He's a lot. He's very melodic. His music has a lot of depth to it, even though he doesn't. He's one of those, rare, he's one of those rappers like Kodak Black in that kind of sense where they don't speak as well in interviews, but through their music, they sound incredibly intelligent, incredibly introspective. They, you know, talking about a lot of themes. They're, they're very vulnerable in their songs, but, you know, maybe in interviews, they're quite cold and standoffish. There might be a reason to all that, but, you know, they're very interesting mix, those two guys. Um, very young, too. I'm sure NBA Youngboy isn't even 20. Maybe he's turned, just turning 20. So they've got, you know, literally the world in their hands. Um, they get paid for shows, you know, they get paid obscene amounts to perform at certain places. They've got brand endorsement deals, they're signed to record labels. So they've, there's not really a need, as maybe it was in the past, to perpetuate this gangster image. There probably isn't a need to kind of um, live. There's not probably that need that other rappers did have in order to kind of, you know, instill fear in people, in order for people to respect you. Because, you know, you're, you've got everything just, um, chipped up or in your favor everyone's kind of lining up and trying to attach their name or their brand to you because you've got some value but then you want to chuck it all away because you want to perpetuate this gangster image and i just don't know what's happening i really don't know what the deal is here i don't know whether or not rolling loud have some responsibility in this as well i'm not sure if they're getting away scot free of this and if this was maybe uh a more forward-facing black um collective of people putting on onto this event whether or not it would be um, treated with such kid gloves, right? Because for the most part, they're treating it as an incident towards NBA Youngboy and T Grizzly. They're not really mentioning Rolling Loud that much in the conversation. It's more so an NBA Youngboy and T Grizzly personal beef thing. I'm not sure if it was a black owned business or in that regard, or maybe a black, uh, a front facing black owned business, whether or not they would immediately try and, you know, tar the owners with responsibility for this too and get them involved in it. I'm not, again, I'm just, I'm just surprised that. The event was able to continue and go on after the amount of shootings or events that happened around it. I think Rick Ross got arrested briefly during that whole Rolling Loud thing too because there was a, a false report of a shooting happening. People started running away. There was reports of Kodak Black being arrested as well for um, uh, outstanding gun charges and shit. Just a whole bunch of mess. And again, I just don't know what is... Um, I'm just eager to see what the next step is in evolution in this scene because you would have hoped after the whole nipsey hustle thing that people would have chilled out a little bit and maybe kind of sought seek some lessons or some kind of um direction from his passing because you know again he was someone trying to do good in the community and trying to empower inspire motivate and give direction to people in the scene but it seems as if you know that has just passed away like you know as most people expect it to that kind of you know collective grief and collective kind of you know introspective um time away and really numerate other things has really passed away for the most part and these young kids just you know they're just going crazy man they're literally going crazy um again r.i.p to the guy that passed away an innocent bystander who kind of had to you know suffer off the back of this it's just it's just a situation that no one really wants to be associated or attach himself to um there's been some good moments in it um i guess for rolling loud in that respect there's been the, the baby situation you know who's had an incredible let's say six months or so or year where he's kind of really blown up and really kind of rose to prominence. He had an amazing, well, for the most part, he had a pretty interesting performance where he supposedly handed out pans of weed, but it was essentially grass that he vacuum packed and like, threw out to the stage, <laughs> which is quite funny. People were giving him stick about the internet. He's like, you know, I'm not going to be throwing out bags of weed, mate, you flipping idiots, right? But again, it got him the attention and the uh, virality that he needed to kind of spread his... And again, he's doing it in the right way. I think there is a way to go viral and not sell yourself out and not be a gimmick and not, you know, um, ruin your credibility uh, or not sell yourself out. And he's done it that right way. Um, that's been good for him. You've seen uh, Lil Uzi Vert, the reemergence of Lil Uzi Vert back out of, from of, from retirement, quote unquote. He's announced that Eternal Take is finished finally. Loads of good things have happened during that performance that you're happy with. But I don't know, man. I don't know. 
um again um i'm just you know i'm just a bit questioning why if you're NBA young boy you would get to that performance do that and then you know suddenly go and go and perform straight away after it might it might be important to go maybe go sit down with the person that got shot that's in your collective i don't know maybe i'm wrong in this but i think there's actually a video here that kind of speaks about it let's see if we can see this a little bit it's supposed to be NBA young boy helping out his girlfriend after the shooting let's see if this play what happens here yeah <laughs> This is crazy, man. <laughs> Mama mia. But yeah, what a life to live, man. What a fucking life to live. Imagine being in America and this being your kind of everyday reality, man. Just, you know what I mean? Going to a festival or a concert and then just being shootings erupting all over the place, you know? It's bad enough with that Las Vegas uh, shooting that happened when that country music show where the guy was shooting from the hotel room. Just imagine just going to a festival and all your favorite artists are fucking, you know, fighting each other outside the venue, shooting at each other and stuff, and you're just you're there none the wiser. It just must be a really true, truly horrible sight to see. Um, Kodak Blessman arrested as well, supposedly, right? Um, again, I think that was an outstanding gun charge, supposedly. Was that the story that came out? Let's see if someone talked to work about that. I think there's a, a clip of video of it on it now. Uh, they got Kodak, but supposedly he's going to be arrested too. So yeah, let's see what happens overall. I'm not sure what the deal is, how they're going to rectify the situation. Um, I'm not sure what the solution is, what's going to happen. Are these kids going to learn? Is there going to be some direction from the top? Is this just like a, a general circumstance of the times you're living in when you're young and wilding and you know, you're trying to get on and you're trying to make, you're trying to kind of uh, feed your family. You might end up doing these kind of crazy wacky things and maybe you evens out and you get better and you just start chilling out. But I don't know. I'm not too sure. But wherever it is, like, it's just scary to see for these kids going up and going to these concerts. Like, you must be really worried. Um, if this was uh, a thing that happened to you, um, yeah, what can you do? Next on the list um, is the situation with uh, James Charles, which has been really weird. Again, I'm pretty sure most of you have kind of heard about it, or ha if you haven't, I'll save you the bother. It's just, you know, standard makeup artist, YouTube drama. Again, there are some maybe lessons to be gleaned on it from the outside looking in. I think for me personally, um, Again, I don't have any investment in any of it because I don't really know or care for any of these people because they're not, again, not people that are in my world for the most part. These makeup artists, I have an appreciation for the for the scene. I think they've done really well in terms of... What I like about the makeup artist scene is the fact that um, the influencers are held to a high standard in terms of how they review products, right? They can't shill for items. Maybe brand endorsements, but when they review makeup, they have to be honest in their reviews because if they're not, um, it kind of ruins their credibility. Um, people kind of, um, you know, essentially um, don't really uh, take what they say seriously anymore. They have to be honest and brutal as much as they can, even with their colleagues about the stuff that they're doing right or wrong. Um, I really like that. I like the fact that, you know, because it's, it's makeup, it's sure improved. You have to put it on your face. So if it's shit, you'll know straight away. That's really good about it. And I also like the fact that they take so much care and attention into the quality of the products, right? The, 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 the pigments, the colors, how it stays on. Um, the packaging is something that I've really been impressed too. They right, they make great packaging. Um, they really take a pay attention to how the packaging feels in your hand, the clasp closure, everything is really there's a lot of attention to detail. But of course, you know, with with all this sort of stuff, with great power comes great responsibility. I just think, you know, when you give all these young kids or people in their bedrooms this level of influence, this level of kind of quote unquote power, it's only going to go one way. And unfortunately, for a, someone like James Charles, who happens to only be nineteen, it seems like it's kind of gone to his head a little bit. He kind of had a big falling out with a lady called Tatty, um, who also does uh, makeup and has a hair supplement company or something along those lines. It, the story goes that supposed to be Tatty, the lady. Um, who's kind of at the center of this whole storm, um, was helping James out, kind of essentially got his career uh, kick-started and gave him a lot of exposure, putting her, putting her videos, all this sort of stuff. It, the, 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 the favor wasn't reciprocated and the, the relationship was a little bit strained, but she you know, she stayed st stuck by him. He was acting out and just being a kid and, you know, just being a little bit crazy, but she was st still stuck by him. Then it kind of went, it kind of got a bit crazy when he went to Coachella and decided to take another brand sponsorship deal with another hair supplement company that is a competition with this young lady Tati's hair company um she got annoyed by it and felt like you know it was a it was a big spit in her face um especially since she asked james charles to uh do an ad for hers and if she, he wanted money she'd give it to him and he didn't want to do it or he kind of was a bit hesitant and as soon as he got to coachella 
and supposedly he needed some help with security. The company offered to give it to him if he did the ad. And he suddenly, you know, suddenly caved and did the ad on his on his stories, on his Instagram stories. That got really hot and bothered. It got the, the community bothered as well because I guess in general, it's kind of been building up some steam. Maybe James Charles had a bit of bad energy out there with the public. People didn't look at him the right way, especially off the back of the Sisters Tour with a really high ticket price for the um, VIP thing. Five, I think it was $500 for a VIP entrance uh, to go see essentially him um, do makeup on stage or to quote unquote sing and do karaoke. People are a bit annoyed by that. So I think it was already the inevitable was going to happen sooner rather than later. I think there was an issue with Jeffree Star too. They hadn't been seen together for a while. So there's already a bit of a friction. And, you know, the makeup industry is extremely clicky. Like most niche or <laughs> no, like most um, subcultures out there, there are people who ride or die with certain individuals and don't like the other ones. So it, it seemed inevitable that it was going to go this way. But it then transpired and it got just, it, it kind of really, really got kicked up a bit when Tati decided to do a 40 minute video, which I'm not going to play, which you kind of details in the entire journey what happened. And now uh, James Charles has suddenly been um, ousted from the makeup community because it's been revealed that he supposedly has a tendency to try and turn straight guys gay. And now the whole makeup community has essentially unfollowed him. Um, that's essentially what's happened. He's been completely unfollowed by everyone in the industry, and now he's completely alone with no one else to help or to be his friend anymore, which is really, really bizarre. Um, and I guess for me, for the most part, I guess with these kind of things, the most important things to glean from this is always lessons that can be applied in IRL. Um, and I think what needs to be said, and I think it's something that has been said and don't need to be replied, apply, uh, re uh, what you call it, repeated that much. Let me see if I can get up here, James Charles on on um. What's your thing called? Uh, Sebastian, Sebastian Williams, whatever it's called. What's his name? Da, 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 da. Let me see if I can get up here. So, yeah, every, every, everyone's unfollowed him and stuff. And what can I see here? Let's go on the video. I said, let's let the lesson glean from all this. Let's go here. Boom, 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 boom. So yeah, um, I guess all the views have really gone down. Let's see if it is. This is from a, a, a person called um, Sebastian William, which is kind of one of the drama T channels that kind of details what everything that's been happening so far in the whole um, situation. But this is a video that kind of talks about it more here. Um, Tati just ended his career, right? Uh, I didn't feel safe talking about any of this. I know that it would get twisted and used against me somehow, so I had to do it this way. I've seen too much happen behind closed doors where things get twisted manipulated and I'm not gonna let that happen to me okay today's video is too hot tea and drama wise another day another career ended which again which I'm not happy with again the, the career ending thing it's like come on man this guy made a mistake he fucked up he really made a really big oopsie as PewDiePie likes to say but let's just let's just take our foot off the pedal a little bit and chill out He's 19 years old. He's got, he got, you know, the power and the fame and the notoriety got to his head. It was clear to see from just cut, just a couple of clips I watched online. And I'm not that too familiar with the guy. I could tell straight away that, you know, he was going a little bit down the wrong path. But it happens to the best of us, right? Like, you know, there is something, there is something really weird about being suddenly becoming an internet celebrity and then it kind of trans, uh, trans, be, what becoming an internet celebrity is one thing. Suddenly, it kind of migrating into real life is a whole other thing. Do you remember when James Charles came to UK and the people on the radio were like, "Oh, who the fuck is this guy? How did he suddenly shut down the entire the the whole of Birmingham?" And you know, people the traffic was insane that one day because he decided to do an appearance at their uh, main shopping mall. Right? There is something about um, there is something about suddenly crossing over into real life that will do that to someone. Like that's why most you know people nowadays are trying to maintain their level of fame to a certain extent and keep it a lid on it because everyone not i think everyone's come to the realization now that that level of fame probably isn't healthy for the average everyday person that can't handle that level of fame so if he's someone at 19 years of years of age that's suddenly famous because he can do makeup really well right um self-taught makeup artist something they didn't, they didn't go to um school or study for or didn't do an apprenticeship under something they haven't been doing for many people something just you know you kind of learned at home and, and honed your craft off something that most people can do if they kind of took the time out you've kind of then become famous of it because you've maybe got a bit more of a, you know, your personality maybe suits the internet a little bit more and people just chose you regardless of what it is. It's something that isn't as deserving of that kind of fame as it probably should be. It probably doesn't, it doesn't, you know, I'm not surprised that you'd go a bit cuckoo and a bit crazy with the power and the kind of love that you're getting, especially because that industry is so clicky, right? Everyone's kind of in it 
to kind of support people that are also famous to kind of prop themselves up. It's, I'm not surprised that it got as crazy as it has, but you know, what do I know? So this is a video from Sebastian Williams. It says, and this caused James to lose 100,000 subs in just a couple of hours, which is insane. Of course, it's showing him losing loads of subs, which everyone seems to be really happy about, which is really strange. It seems that James was literally buying, trying to buy subs. A sub count went up, un, un, up to 20K again. Can't blame him, man. He's trying to rescue his career, man. Like, lot of fucking hell. Give the guy a break. So his sub count's going down. Cool show. Thanks for evidence. I just wanted to say I respect Tati so much for being so brave and talking about the situation so professionally. Eh, brave is a, a really bit of a stretch, I guess. She was involved with somebody who kind of snaked her and bit her in the back and kind of, you know, essentially kind of, you know, went behind her back. There's nothing brave in that really out in somebody that used to be your friend and that did something like that to you. It's a bit disrespectful. They betrayed your trust. I've got a bit of a problem with an adult such as Tati going after a kid like that so hard because I'm sure she was aware that she probably had she was she I'm sure she must have been aware in some way, shape or form that she was going to be the one responsible for dealing the killer blow. Has to have crossed your mind. It has to. You can't have not known that you were going to be the one to really put the fire nail in the coffin. Because it seems like, again, for me from the outside, it seems like some people did have a little bit of ill will or ill feeling towards James, but it wasn't his level because, you know, people closest to him hadn't really come out and said anything because I think, you know, they knew what, they knew the power of their words. But Tati went out and kind of, you know, just lit the whole thing on fire. And again, I just don't know what the means to an end is because it's like, if you're trying to rescue, if you're trying to repair the relationship, it's not going to happen, right? Especially in this way and matter. I don't think people can be embarrassed like this and then suddenly then want to rectify or repair the relationship. I don't think it works that way. And if you're trying to make it a teachable, less teachable moment, that's not going to happen either because people, the internet deals in absolutes. It's either you're all the way innocent or all the way guilty. There is no middle ground. So people already made their mind up on, on James and, you know, he's kind of suffered forever for this and he probably will never be able to recover again properly unless, you know, he goes on a, on a massive redemption tour. And I just, again, I just don't think it's the right thing to do. Personally, I just don't think it's the right thing to do. I just think this whole council culture thing is just a little bit too crazy for me. I think, you know, the dude made a mistake. He fucked up. But he's 19, man. Let's take that into context, please. If that's not, if that's not, I don't know, when suddenly the internet decided to, just, you know, uh, what do you call it? Decided to judge everyone by the same moral compass or same age compass right if you're 19 you make a mistake it's the same as a 37 year old make a mistake or a 55 year old or 45 year old or 60 it's not the same thing i'm sorry man like he was a nobody a kid and he grew up on the internet and suddenly became an overnight celebrity or not an overnight but you know essentially a celebrity in you know in the last five or so years doing makeup right um i'm not surprised he went a bit cuckoo let's give him a chance to rectify it if he can if he can't cool but Let's give him a chance. <clears throat> These are loads of tweets and DMs people are sending out there. defending uh, After defending him and showing love on YouTube and privacy as well, this is what he replied to me, and I'm happy the truth is out. Oh, shit, again. All this saving of... I, I really detest the whole like screenshots, receipts, posts of people's intimate private messages you've had with them online. It's so disgusting, man. I just don't like it whatsoever. I think it's disgusting. So what now? We're living in a world now where you have to be careful what you send to people message-wise because they might use it against you in the future. Like, I said that thing to you in that moment because I was feeling like that, right? Now suddenly things have changed and you're using that message I sent to you as something to beat me over the head with. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. It's horrible. I just don't see the use of it. I don't see why people are doing it. I don't see why it's a good thing. It's just horrible. I hate all of it. Do you not care? I don't. I, I don't care, man. I'm done. I don't care. I've tried it. I tried to, I tried to, I tried to act like I care, but I just don't care. I think it's everyone comes out of this looking bad. James, her, all the fucking attached people, Jeffrey Stolf. Everyone looks horrible. They've all piled onto a 19 year old who made a mistake, who fucked up, who let the power and the fame get to their head. It happens. You know, it's social media, it's influencer culture. These things, these stories are 
repeated all over the scene, whether it's from streetwear to fashion to makeup to photography. There are uh, the whole bevy of influencers, YouTubers who have got fame, power. They let they get to their head. They made a mistake, and suddenly now everyone's trying to kill them and delete them from the internet. Like, what are you doing? They've all unfollowed him. All these cool friends, Kylie Jenner, Iggy Azalea, all these people have all unfollowed him. Shane Dawson because of the revelations that have come out. But let's be honest. Do they, all these people, were they not aware of everything that was around, the allegations that were attached to his name? Were they not aware of it prior? And now sudden publicly, they're all kind of ousting him and kind of distancing themselves. And again, what good is that going to do for him in general? How is he going to learn? How is he going to recover or come back from this? And let's say, God forbid, something drastic happens, right? And something really crazy happens to him. How guilty would these people feel that the person that they all deem as a friend, the person that he thought he could rely on, suddenly oust him and leave him alone and don't talk to him anymore and kind of, you know, ostracize him and he does something drastic? How will they feel if that stuff happens? How will they feel about it? They'll be the first to kind of come out there and start making, you know, condolence posters and stuff. But look what you're doing when a person needed you the most. It's just like, that's the issue I have with influencer culture. I just think it's so, so fake. It's the worst, isn't it? Any kind of public outrage, you immediately see who your friends are. That's why I was really happy with the Virgil Abloh stuff when it comes with a diversity argument or conversation that happened to him on Hypebeast and stuff. Like, I was happy to see so, so many of his friends ride out because generally when personal scandal hits you and stuff, no one really comes to your back to support you. Everyone kind of just leaves you alone and kind of lets you kind of rot out there because, you know, you've got, the, you've got the mark on you. You've got the X on you, right? They don't want to be tarnished with your bad due to your bad vibes. They want to leave you alone because they don't want anyone else to come after them either, which is really disgusting. And again, I've got no time for it. I just think it's just not on. I think he made a mistake. He fucked up. Cool. Let him have his moment on the naughty step. But if he wants to come back and make an amends, let him come back and make an amends. But all this public chastising, people coming out and making making up fake DMs, people coming out and ousting every little weird interaction he had and public is saying how uncomfortable they are at a time about this thing happening and all of a sudden they've got a moral backbone but at the time no one said anything. It's just this collective morality is just something I've never been a fan of, man. Stand up for something at the time when no one's standing up for it, cool. And then take all the beatings, fine. But don't this now, it's a trendy thing to do. Now you want to stand up for it. Like, I've got no time for that whatsoever, man. It's just disgusting all the way around. I'm not, I'm not a fan. And again, I just don't care about it. I think it's maybe a symptom of the reality TV stage we're living in at the moment. That everyone wants a reality TV show. They're essentially doing it for free online. But it's not for me, man. It's just not for me. It's just so fucking tedious. It's like, ugh. But hey, I guess you have to do something, innit? you got to do something. Um, What else is on here? Uh, Nike app, Nike app, Nike app, Nike app. This looks pretty interesting. So there's this um, new Nike app that's going to supposedly allow you to um, have the right fit for your trainers suddenly overall, something that I'm kind of surprised they haven't done sooner, but it looks pretty cool um, concept. Let's put it up here on the screen here. Mm -mm -mm. Free transfer, let's get to the screen. So there's this app here. What's it called? It's called What Is Nike Fit? I saw it the other day on Hypebeast. Actually, I thought it was pretty cool. So let me put this up here on the screen. So this is Nike Fit from Nike website. As soon as you guys can see here. Boom, boom, boom. Did you know that three out of every five people are, are likely wearing the wrong size shoe? That's partly because the system in the industry uses to determine the shoe size is antiquated. It's not just the equipment. It's essentially a foot rule of a measurement scale based on a barely corn, uh, corn kennel on a barley corn kennel but the concept of sizing itself length and width don't provide nearly enough data to get a shoe fit correctly sizing as we know is a gross simplification of a, of a complex problem which is very very true right i have the same issue um i've always kind of it's weird because when i was younger i was a, a comfortable size 11 i'd say but i usually try and squeeze into a 9 and a 10 because obviously when you if you're 16 and or no, between the age of 14 and 16 the last thing you want to be known as is a kid with a you know size 10 feet because everyone in your year is able to buy if they've got small enough feet they can buy kid size they can buy girl sizes they can buy sizes under nine that look really good on that kind of you know frame of a kid if you're like five like let's say between five five and five ten it probably fits you a bit better but once you've got such a big foot especially like that i think i was a five nine at the time too i essentially had flappers so that didn't really help my core points in school and again, um, I find it difficult because I've always had really wide feet, especially back then when I didn't do any training and I wasn't squatting and stuff. Now my feet aren't wide because I've essentially built a bit of an arch and my foot is kind of, you know, uh, concaved in a bit more. It's not as flat as it was in prior, but because it was so flat and long, my foot was always a bit strange. I could never really wear uh, pointy Air Max type of shoes. I always have to wear kind of Air Forces, um, wide base kind of shoes, right? 
even Vans work a bit of a struggle. I couldn't wear Converse's. Those plimps I was from Brick Lane, I couldn't wear because I was really thin. Swears I couldn't wear at the time when they were really popular. That's why essentially I wore a lot of Wallabies. If you know Wallabies shoe size, it's essentially like a massive rectangle in the front of the toe. So those are shoes I tend to go for. And again, I had trouble because my foot was really wide and long. So I couldn't, every time, it's usually whenever you go longer, the feet get a little bit wider, but not as much as you need it to be. So you have to go either sometimes a half a size bigger in order to kind of get the maximum space you want. But then once you go half a size bigger and you wear your shoe regularly, like I would have done with the wallaby and stuff, it tends to kind of um, expand and get a bit loose. Then you end up with flappers, you end up creasing a lot, and you end up with a fucking horrible shoe. So size has always been a bit of an issue. And obviously, you know, usually for the most part, most humans have one foot bigger than the other. And mine, I think, is essentially like a half a size bigger than the other one. So there's a lot of issues that run into that one. So ha being able to have a, an accurate measuring system to actually see what, how, what your size shoe is, how it's going to fit into an other shoe would be really handy, especially since a, a company like Nike or most athletic companies, most sports brands, even Adidas, have different molds for different shoes. They're not the same last, right? They're a different last. The, the way the heel rises, the way the, um, the sole is from the ground, the drop all that sort of stuff impacts how your feet kind of sit on it the padding on the inside so it's important to get that right because if you don't especially nowadays with how expensive nike shoes are if you get it wrong it's a fucking hugely costly mistake man so it says the following enter nike fit a scanning solution that uses proprietary combination of computer vision computer vision data science machine learning artificial intelligence and recommendation algorithm it does this by measuring the full shape of the both feet offering an ability to show know your truly perfect size of each nike shoe style which is incredible right um how nike fit works it's quite cool like certain so augmented reality so you take a picture of yourself standing up straight with your um with your back to a wall while shopping on nike app there is a moment we all face when we get closer person a pair again which i'm interested to see if this is uh, again it, it, privacy is because we had a conversation the other day about it with somebody at, at the party how they were like the privacy thing is a bit scummy you know doing my facebook advertising a bit scummy i understood what they were talking about but we've got so far in life right with the data privacy thing that we're probably going to be able to sign away everything because of convenience because there is a part of me that's thinking, where, why did this app come around? And I bet you any money this app came around because Nike have the data, of the on, especially on the online side, so they have the, the data and the hard numbers to back up that there's a big, huge swath of the population that goes on their website, um, scans around, browses for a shoe that they like, adds it to their cart, goes to checkout, and then kind of hovers over the, oh no, or goes to a shoe that they like, adds it to their cart, no, goes, goes to a shoe that they like, clicks on the size chart and tries to figure out what size they are. And then they don't make the purchase, right? They kind of back out. They kind of delete the car or they just kind of X off. They have the data to kind of prove it because I'm sure Amazon have the same sort of thing, right? They have the data to prove where your cursor lands on the screen, how 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 often you hover a certain item. So I'm sure this app came about because of that data. They had numbers to prove that people weren't completing their transactions because they get stumped on the size chart thing. And because Nike have stores all over the place, people would much rather just not buy them online have a picture of them, maybe take a screenshot and then go into a store and then try them on. Or maybe just don't go around to get it. So they're probably losing a whole bunch of money because people aren't sure what size feet they are exactly in the shoe that they want to buy. So that's probably where it's come from. And again, that's what I'm saying. The privacy and sort of conversation is hard to have because how are they getting this data? How are they understanding that people are not adding things to their cart after they click the shoe size thing, um, size chart thing? How are they doing it? Because they're tracking us, right? They're able to read those numbers. So... If you want your privacy and your data, you're probably not going to get a Nike Fit app. If you want a Nike Fit app, you're going to have to sacrifice your privacy and data so they can understand, you know, what your buying decisions or uh, shopping habits are like so they can then feed it into this app. But anyway, um, let's continue. Um, what size am I? This this is where Nike Fit comes in. When you go select your size, there'll be a few options that ask you whether you'd like to try Nike Fit. So it's all built into the shopping app, which is amazing. Using your smartphone's camera, Nike Fit will scan your feet, collecting free 13 data points, mapping your foot morphology for both feet within the matter of section. Matter of second, sorry. This hyper um, accurate scan of your unique foot dimension can then be stored in your Nike Plus member profile and easily used for future shopping online and in store. You can also use Nike Fit in Nike Retail store the experience leverages especially developed nike fit mat rather than a wall and allows store, store athletes to help recommendation with best fit on whatever shoe you're shopping for if you want to shop for a family or friends you can enter a guest mode that will allow you to use or scan their feet nike fit will be great for parents trying to figure out what size clear a uh, cleat basketball shoe or runner the little one needs this time how to apply it once you scan your feet, you'll be offered the best fit for you recommendations for that footwear wherever you shop in whatever wherever you shop. 
um, in the app or in store. For example, if you've used the Nike Fit to scan your feet and you go to purchase a Nike Cortez on the Nike app, you won't see a run of sizes anymore. Instead, you'll just see your size for that particular shoe. Oh, wow. Um, then if you go buy a Nike Air Zoom Pegasus, you might see another size. This because the different shoes are made up of different performance intent. A running shoe works best for athlete when a little bit more snug, while a sportswear shoe is designed to have more room for everyday wear. Why Nike Fit matters? Nike Fit is a transformative solution and industry first using protective technology. In short, Nike Fit will improve the way Nike designs, manufactures and sells shoes. Yeah, that's very true because imagine all the data points they're going to be getting for people um, analyzing their feet, um, what they're buying, the kind of foot that's buying a particular kind of shoe, um, the tendency to maybe plus to size up a little bit, maybe they'll maybe change the last. It's really, really game changing to be honest. I think it's going to be a really, really clever invention and something that, again, it's just probably going to add more to their bottom dollar. And again, like I said, this is all coming because they're tracking your buying habits. They're seeing what you're clicking on. They're seeing your stuff, your mouse cursor is hovering over, and then they're asking you to then go and um, give them that information they can apply into their app. And again, I'm surprised it's only come around now. I remember seeing a, another app, an augmented reality app, where they were able to scan a room so if you went to scan a room to kind of fit i think it's ikea furniture one actually that might be a cool thing right imagine you go to ikea and usually when you go you sometimes measuring the space that you have in your room and maybe to the closest centimeter and you're taking the measurements and you go into ikea and hoping that stuff that you buy matches up to where you got put your stuff in your own house right but i'm pretty sure i saw something an augmented reality thing for ikea where it could essentially you could essentially um scan the place in your, in your house save it and then go into ikea and kind of make sure it fits stuff lines up with the stuff that you have you know just um, with the space that you kind of measure on your camera that'd be pretty cool but i'm interested to see how nike fit develops i'm sure loads because you know people the, the industry is just full of copycats i'm sure a lot of other brands will come and start copying the idea and try and do the same sort of thing um let's see how they do it going forward but i think it's a pretty cool idea man. i think it's going to work out really really well um that's nike fit i'm pretty sure it's available is it available now already i'm not sure it doesn't say when it's available but it should be already built into the app itself so let's see um how it goes what else we have here on the list uh black china fake harvard school um uh this is a, a weird one uh, again i'm not sure what the deal is here it's very interesting to say the least um it's a story that kind of broke a while back ago but i've kind of only mentioning it now because you know again i'm late and slow on this sort of matters but it's supposedly a uh, black china fake that she was getting into harvard uh, she put a fake kind of acceptance letter out there on the internet which i don't really know why she did that in the first place but again you know celebrities do weird things um this is a headline from tmz uh black china harvard harvard says she's not admitted except to let us it's fake um an update black china isn't coming close to sniffing a degree or certificate from harvard the school is totally dis disavowing her harvard tells tmz harvard business school has not admitted or provided any such letters for a person named angela white uh, referring to her alleged acceptance the letter her team gave us china told us school is going to help me make things up a couple of notches people are always talking about me might as well talk about the good not looking so good right now blah 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 Brad China's intent in study intent of studying Harvard Business School online course was hatched by a PR firm that offered to do all the work and even take a pic of her wearing a Harvard hoodie for a price. TMZ broke the story. China has accepted to take the Harvard online course called Business Analytics, teaching students how to interpret data and make savvy business decisions. We found out China was not wind got wind of the course through an email sent to a team by Christian Imaliano, who refers himself to a social media renaissance man. Christian's email pitch for $3,250. Our team will complete all coursework for you. All you have to do is take one test. We will provide you with a study guide and then take credit for the program. Once completed, China could add Harvard education to her resume and improve her brand, which is fucking nuts, man. Wow. Again, it shows the kind of depths of social media, doesn't it? Um, influencer culture uh recognition for things because if you're black china you'd have to if you if from the outside looking in you have to be a bit wor worried or uh, trying to be not worried you have to be a little bit like um curious as to why she thinks this is an important step for her career right essentially she's made a pretty good career out of herself some people would not agree with the thing that she's done but you know if you don't have any scruples or any sort of morals and you're just out there to get the check and to provide for your family and make sure you have a certain way of life or you're able to maintain a certain lifestyle what she's done is you know pretty part of the course right um you don't necessarily see why there's a need for her to do this to go into harvard business lane right because i'm sure she gets paid a pretty penny for appearances she gets paid a pretty penny to endorse beauty products and all that sort of malarkey there's probably not a need for her brand to evolve or to step up really right because you know as long as 
she's fairly young still i'm assuming she's probably not in her is she in her 30s not in the 40s at least she probably still has another good 20 years or so to kind of milk the whole beauty industry um the forever young kind of industry and then maybe it can kind of evolve out of there but there's no real need for a career to kind of suddenly make a 360 turn right unless you know she kind of feels as if like um a lot of opportunities are being blocked because of the way that she's perceived in public maybe that might be the thing about that but again, it's a bizarre way. It's a bizarre one to do. I think the Kim Kardashian lawyer thing probably makes more sense because, you know, she's she has taken a bit of a step back from the whole, like, you know, first chat things online. She's maybe segued into being more of a mum. You know, she's got four kids now. So maybe the lawyer thing makes a bit more sense in terms of, you know, who she is instead of, you know, posing naked for several magazines might not be the way to go forward anymore. But... If you're black china i don't really see the need or the need to do this really in general um unless maybe again it's just for her own business she just wants to be a better business person but you know faking accepting letters to get into a harvard i think it's an online course as well is a little bit dodge um but again it shows the re- it shows the fucking the unlimited depths people will go to on social media there's a service out there someone will offer you to take the test for you get you a, a hoodie to wear it's just fucking incredible isn't it that people will do that sort of thing um the story continues um it gets better you can go to harvard campus and take a picture of a harvard hoodie on you can get you can post updates on your snapchat and instagram stories as as for where the three thousand and two hundred the, the, the money will go to two thousand two thousand two hundred and fifty for the course and one thousand for us to complete the entire course for you we contacted china's people and although they acknowledged they got christian's pitch china never hired him and decided to take the course on her own christian confirmed that to us as well turns out as we posted our story this morning another social media star also posted her admission letter to the harvard business school online so christian may not be the rick singer the guy who got oliver jade and whatever they're there but his personal proposal seemed to offer the same underhanded way of succeeding in college without really trying which again is very very strange isn't it but i guess you know again not really sure what the point of this whole issue is or this whole story is not sure why she decided to go this route with her harvard thing but i guess you know, everyone's trying to rebrand themselves and give themselves other opportunities i guess maybe you know there's another segue that she can make in her career but very very bizarre way of going about things and really spits in the face of what kids are doing nowadays right there's a whole message or saying out there that people should you know maybe for go college education to just go straight into you know doing the thing that they're most passionate about working an apprenticeship interning and stuff and then there's celebrities that have all the opportunity in the world to do that kind of thing and they're going back into school which is interesting um way of thinking right it's a bit backwards isn't it what's actually happening in society but again maybe there's more to it that i don't know about whatever it may be um i just think it probably isn't worth the again it's just not worth the backlash in public because when you get caught out for it it just doesn't it doesn't stop right they're going to keep going after you until you kind of sit there and admit it and start crying on a video so it probably just isn't worth it unless you can actually get away with it but nowadays it's impossible because everyone's looking to find out what you're doing why you're doing it it's never you know no one really gives you the benefit of doubt anymore at all whatsoever so you really have to be on your p's and q's when you're doing these sort of things and unfortunately with people taking pictures of emails and text messages and all that sort of malarkey like it's just impossible to do this thing properly or to, to lie like that in that extent and get away with it. it's just really possible but anyway i'm sure she'll figure it out she doesn't need my help in that regard um and i guess that's it man 110 one ten, the excellent Zinger Show. Thank you so much for tuning in, man. One ten, one minute, one or nearly one hour and ten. This has been excellent Zinger Show episode number one nine three. As ever, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, excellent Zinger. For more information regarding myself, click my website on the link below, excellentzinger.com. All of it's there. If you're listening via the podcast app, leave me a five star review. Watching through YouTube, like and subscribe. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think of the show. And I'll see you guys again for another episode of the Agus Nozinga Show live and direct somewhere in the depths of East London. Not sure exactly where I am because I'm not going to divulge that on the internet. But those that know, know. But before that, peace out. Take care. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow. See ya.